has one of the most diverse wildlife populations in the United States. But rapid urban development is removing vital native habitat many animals need to survive. Most critically, their food supply. But there are ways you can help. One of the best ways to help urban wildlife is to simply restore some of the natural elements missing in your landscape by adding a variety of plants that support nature's complex food web. Plant parts are a primary food source for many animals. A good habitat has plants that feed insects, so it's beneficial to decrease insecticide use in your yard because it will increase the food supply for insect-eating animals. Insect and plant eaters are eaten by larger predators like small birds and mammals, which in turn are eaten by birds of prey and larger mammals at the top of the animal food web. Some animals are also omnivores, like the cardinal, which means they eat plant and animal foods. Most baby birds eat insects while still in the nest, and they eat other foods when they're older. But even if an animal has a preference for a particular food, some are only available during certain times of the year. So it's important to have several different plant varieties in your yard providing food year-round. For example, squirrels can only eat acorns in the fall and winter, and during the spring they eat other plant parts and bird eggs. Here are some examples of native plants you can put in your landscape that will provide fruit for a variety of birds and small mammals. In addition to using native plants, there are also artificial ways to provide food. Some of the easiest and most visible creatures to attract are birds. Bird feeding is undoubtedly the most popular wildlife recreational activity in Florida. In 1986, almost 70% of Floridians responding to a statewide survey said they feed birds or other wildlife. Most of us participate in this activity simply because we enjoy watching our wild neighbors. Florida ranks second in the nation for consumer interest in birds, with $477 million spent on bird watching and related products every year. But you don't have to leave your home to enjoy bird watching. You can attract them to your own backyard with desired food sources and habitat. Today we're going to visit with Ron Robinson who is an avid birder and he's going to show us a lot of things he's done in his yard to attract birds. He has a lot of bird feeding, some fabulous uh, bird feeding operations as well as bird houses and, and water uh, that he has for birds. So we're going to talk to uh, Ron and see what he's provided for birds in his yard. So what do we have here, Ron, to start off with? Well, this, Joe, this is what I call a, a platform feeder in the sense that it has uh, one large area here for birds to land on and such. Uh, a lot of birds uh, won't go to anything that moves or has any type of swinging motion or such as that, so they like this firm uh, platform here that simulates ground, the ground situation. And one, one of the two of the features about this I'd like to show you, if you notice, if you pick that f wood frame up there, it has at the bottom, it's made out of wire screen. And that's so water can go through there when it rains, so your seed dries out and doesn't spoil and go and get moldy or Excellent. sprout on there. Yeah, that's a problem sometimes. Yeah, and particularly when your traffic's first coming up. But right. this is the basic unit you'd want to you'd want to use. Start off with just a basic platform, and after a while you can add the hopper type situation like this on here. So you, when you start using more seed, but at first to just come out and put a seed some seed on every few days, it work out just fine. This is when you build up your traffic a little bit. 
It's mounted, if you see on a piece of PVC pipe here, it could be PVC conduit or PVC water pipe or any kind of pipe you can buy at just about any plumbing supply store. This one happens to be painted green, but squirrels can't get enough leverage around the pipe because their arms are short to try to climb up there. And a minimum of six inch uh, diameter is what you need to, 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 to feed the squirrels on that. Okay. And it has to be about 12 feet away from the nearest tree branches and about five feet off the ground because they can jump over about 12 feet. So if you're that far away, you pretty much have them at bay for a while. This is a very sturdy bird feeder made out of metal. And one additional feature this has is that the front, the perch for the birds is weighted so that if a heavy type feeder such as a squirrel comes up to feed off of the seeds, perches right here, closes the door, prevents access to the seeds. So it's only available to light weighted birds such as cardinals, titmice, chickadees, etc. Heavy birds, even crows, it'll close, no access to the seeds. Another technique to try to discourage squirrels from eating all your bird seed is to provide food specially for squirrels, either corn on the cob or maybe uh, something such as this where you have uh, several seeds together, a lot of whole corn and sunflower seeds. So this is one technique you can use. Another one is to simply put cayenne pepper or some kind of hot pepper uh, mixed in with your bird seed. And this won't affect the birds at all, but it'll discourage the squirrels from eating your bird seed. Joe, here's, here's something else you might want to uh, show your viewers. It's, uh, this is a little uh, plot I put in, a seed plot. Uh, it's real, very easy to do. Anybody who has basic uh, gardening skills could do it. Just break up a, your soil a little bit mm -hmm. and take some of your bird seed mix, uh, preferably the white millet and the sunflower seeds and anything else you have like that. A lot of your common garden flowers also attract birds in. They like to eat the seeds. Uh -huh. And just put them in the area that you break up and just let it come up, water it once or twice, maybe a little bit of fertilizer like you would any other plant mm -hmm. and you'll be surprised when when this matures out it hasn't quite matured yet the birds will really go to it uh -huh. they really like it it's so a natural low maintenance really basically per, no maintenance yeah. at all and it's a it's a good naturalistic setting and the birds really like so what, it what do you call this yeah, that's yeah. my bird plot your bird plot okay <laughs> <laughs> okay ron tell us about this one well, Joe, what we have here is sort of a combination of things. Uh, we'll start at the top. Uh, on the top, I have what I call a squirrel baffle. There's several different types. This is a, a one that I made myself, but you could also buy those at the store made out of different materials. And then it comes down here to a regular store-bought hanging feeder, what I call hanging feeder. Uh, this, the advantage of this is for a lot of people maybe don't, don't want to feed uh, some of the larger blackbirds or doves or things like that. They will not uh -huh. land, those type of birds will not land on anything that moves that is uh -huh. not solid. Uh -huh. So this, this feeder is particularly good for attracting in birds like chickadees and titmice and cardinals and chipping sparrows and things uh -huh. like that. Okay. That uh, will also use your platform feeder but will really just use this uh, as well you know so it can go if both ways. traffic over there well then they can come over they can here. come over here yeah and this is a little uh, hanging uh, suet feeder or peanut butter feeding it's a mixture that I make with cornmeal lard and peanut butter mm -hmm. and you can see the birds been pecking at it quite a bit today that was all, right. all put on there this morning and particularly in the winter time that mixture goes very well uh -huh. and uh, works out real good so you there. take a knife and spread it in yeah there, right? knife from a hand make a little ball and spread it on yeah. there and they'll land on the perch or hang a lot of woodpeckers like that and uh -huh. warblers and birds you could never attract to eat seed right. will come to suet because they use it for a protein substitute for insects okay. in the colder days Hummingbirds are one group of wildlife species that most people are interested in attracting to their yards. Of the 338 known species of hummingbirds, only three live in Florida. Black-chinned and rufous hummingbirds are rare and usually only seen during the winter. But the ruby-throated hummingbird is common through most of the state. Ruby-throated males arrive in Florida in March, with females following them a week later. Nesting begins in April. To be successful in attracting hummingbirds around your house, you must provide them with an abundance of the energy-rich liquid foods they need to support their high-speed activity. I just finished cleaning out my hummingbird feeder with uh, vinegar and water to get rid of the bacteria, any bacteria that may have formed in there. And now I'm going to fill it back up before I put it outside. I boiled some water and I'm going to add some sugar, just granulated sugar, about one-fourth of a cup 
to one cup of water. Now my feeder will hold about three cups of solution, but I want to clean out my feeder about every four days to prevent bacteria growth from accumulating. So I'm only going to put in about a cup and then the hummingbirds, I only have about one family here feeding at my hummingbird feeder and they'll, they'll drink about a cup in about four days. So I have one fourth of a cup of sugar and I'll pour in about a cup of boiling water to help it dissolve better. Stir it up a little bit. There, and now it's completely dissolved. And you can either let it cool off by itself uh, for an hour or two, or if you want to put it out right away, you can add an ice cube or two to cool it off. There, now we're ready to put it back up outside. I have my hummingbird feeder in a relatively shaded area underneath this big tall oak tree. That way the bacteria doesn't build up as fast. If I had it in a more sunny area, then I'd want to change the nectar a little bit more frequently. And also have it outside of a window here so we can watch and enjoy the hummingbirds when they come to the feeder. Okay, now Ron, we have a very unique type of feeder here, don't we? Yeah, Joe, this is something I'm, I'm trying this year for the first time, and I think it'd be a good idea for anyone interested in getting started in hummingbird feeding, in that I've taken this ground-mounted feeder instead of a hanging feeder, and uh, it's on a piece of three-quarter inch PVC pipe, and then I have a half-inch PVC pipe that goes down in the middle, and that's okay. how I mount it on there and take it off for easy cleaning. Uh -huh. And then I have it, I placed it purposely here because it's right next to this coral bean or Cherokee bead plant, right. which is very attractive to hummingbirds birds and for anyone that wants to get started uh, in hummingbird feeder is to take your, your feeder and plant it real close to a desirable plant such as this anything with a red tubular flower mm -hmm. that hummingbirds like and it's a sure thing that you'll get them to your feeder. It's easy to provide hummingbird feeders in your yard but adding a few hummingbird plants is recommended. The sugar solution in feeders may appeal to a hummingbird sweet tooth but it doesn't provide all the nourishment they need. Nectar is much more than water and sugar. Your garden should have several flowering nectar plants available from March to September. Hummingbirds prefer flowers that are red, orange, or pink and tubular in shape, either large and solitary or in loose drooping clusters. It's best to have a variety of these flowers and to plant them in several groupings so that several hummingbirds can feed at the same time without conflict. They do not like to share good food sources with each other. Attracting butterflies is another rewarding outdoor activity, and it's easy. More than 100 butterfly species can be found in Florida, and the only requirement for attracting them is choosing the right plants. Many adult butterflies will drink nectar from a variety of brightly colored, simple flowers that are not too deep and are wide enough for good perching platforms. It's good to have several types of nectaring flowers so that some are blooming and providing a nectar supply throughout most of the year. Butterflies will spend even more time in your yard if you provide food for their young by planting butterfly host or larval food plants. Some plants are host to several different butterflies, like the passion vine, which feeds gulf fritillary and zebra longwing caterpillars. But usually, each species requires one specific plant or plant family, like the giant swallowtail, that eats only plants in the citrus family during its larval stage. Keep in mind, if you're successful in attracting the right female butterflies, your host plants will ultimately be chewed on. But that's part of the enjoyment of butterfly gardening. One of the biggest fears that uh, people express to me, people who are interested in having a butterfly garden, is that all their plants will get chewed up by the caterpillars. But even though I do have, um, you might say, a problem over on this side of the yard, it's with one plant only where the caterpillar population has built up and those caterpillars are eating that particular vine. Uh, I might mention here that those caterpillars, the Gulf fritillary caterpillars, do not eat any other plant except that, that passion vine. The rest of the yard, as you can see, is uh, very lush and pretty and not affected by the uh, abundance of Gulf fritillary caterpillars at all. There are four stages in the butterfly life cycle, egg, larva, chrysalis, and adult. 
Butterfly eggs are laid on a larval food plant and caterpillars emerge within a few days. These larvae have enormous appetites and do nothing else but eat. This is a cassia plant. Many plants that we consider weeds, such as cassia, the butterflies enjoy. Two butterfly species here in Alachua County lay eggs on cassia. Here we have um, a sleepy orange caterpillar and also the cloudless sulfurs lay eggs on this plant. All caterpillars must have defenses to protect them against their many predators. And this particular caterpillar's defense is his color. He uh, blends very well into the green of the leaves. When their skin is stretched as far as possible, they molt or shed the old skin. After a few molts, they form a chrysalis or pupae. The pupal stage can last anywhere from a few days to a year, depending on the species. But eventually, a beautiful butterfly emerges. In nature, only 1% of the butterfly eggs laid actually become adults. Birds and other predators are quick to eat these larvae, so few get large enough to do extensive damage to host plants. In fact, very few butterfly species, unlike moths, cause significant problems to home and vegetable gardens. Most butterfly gardeners are happy to share their parsley and dill for the pleasure of watching black swallowtails grow. Remember, caterpillars only eat the specific host plants you provide for them. For example, a monarch lays her eggs exclusively on milkweeds. Providing food for wildlife is as simple as putting up feeders, offering a variety of nectar sources for hummingbirds and butterflies, and having food plants that supply young tender leaves and berries during the different seasons of the year. No matter where you live or what kind of yard you have, you can do your part for wildlife by developing a native habitat that will be attractive to you and a variety of animal species. Be sure to contact your local Cooperative Extension Service. They have all the information you need to get your backyard wildlife habitat started. Landscaping for Florida's Wildlife is a three-part video series available from University of Florida's Institute of Food and Agricultural Sciences. The three videos, providing food, providing cover, and providing water, can be purchased separately or as a set from the IFAS Extension Bookstore at 1-800-226-1764. As our human population continues to grow, our native wildlife is being squeezed out of the habitat they need to survive. But there are some simple ways we can offer the basic needs of many wildlife species, even in small urban backyards. One of the basic needs of all wildlife is some type of cover. We can provide vegetation, nesting areas, burrows, rock piles, or brush piles with a few simple guidelines. One of the best things you can do to try to attract wildlife to your yard is try to restore the native ecosystem or plant community that once occurred there before your house was built. And Linda Jones is a homeowner who has done exactly that. What are some of the things you've done, Linda? Well, I live in a planned urban development, so they have a few restrictions. I wanted to keep with the flow of the neighborhood, but still put in plants that were native to the area, mm -hmm. like cabbage palms, saw palmettos, and zamia. 
I also had an opportunity to add a few enhancements like butterfly gardens and ponds. Uh-huh. Well, let's go take a look at some of those, okay? Great. Well, Joe, this is a section of our backyard, and as you can see, it's pretty natural looking, not much grass here, mm -hmm. and I tried to have layers. These are volunteer ferns, and it provides a lot of low-level ground cover, mm -hmm. and then I planted some saw palmetto and wax myrtle, and a lot of birds eat the berries, and we've also had nesting birds, especially wrens and robins, and we also have some taller trees, the scrub oaks that were already here, and then we've planted things like magnolia and holly trees, which mm -hmm. also have great berries for birds. Mm -hmm. Wildlife, like people, need housing or cover to protect them from adverse weather conditions. Good cover also provides protective hiding places from predators. Safe cover areas are even more important during feeding, so an animal can retreat if it feels threatened. More birds will visit a bird feeder if there is a safe perch found in nearby shrubs. Abundant and diverse vegetation will also encourage birds to nest in the area. Even though each species has its own nesting requirements, a garden with evergreen and deciduous trees, shrubby underbrush, thickets, and protected ground covers will attract most nesters. One third of all forest dwelling wildlife use tree cavities for nesting or refuge. Most cavity nesting birds are insectivorous and help control the population of forest insect pests. Some tree cavities are found in living trees, but most are in dead trees that are still standing, also called snags. These are often removed from the landscape, which then severely limits the number of nesting spots available. Without these cavities, many animals will not even nest even if there's adequate food and water. Leaving one or two snags standing per quarter acre lot is one of the greatest services we can do for wildlife. If you don't already have a snag in your yard, you can plant one, like homeowner Ron Robinson did. I planted this here, it's what I call my dead tree forest. It's a, it's a dead pine tree that uh, I took from the woods that had died, and I planted it in the ground here uh, with some plastic here to keep the, from the ants and the termites getting in there to, to rot it so it would fall down. But right. uh, there's a very, very severe shortage of dead trees in the woods, unbelievable, because people get uh, chainsaws as soon as a tree dies, first thing you do is cut it down. <clears throat> There's about 48 species of birds that are totally dependent on natural cavities that occur in, in trees like this. So what kind of birds you have using this one? Well, right off the bat, we had uh, red belly woodpeckers come in within a matter of weeks after I put it up, and they uh -huh. built the first hole, which was one on the top, and they've nested in it two or three times. We've had titmice nested in it, uh -huh. chickadees. Uh, I think bluebirds tried one year and didn't complete a nest, so it's had a lot of traffic. Every uh -huh. year I've had a nest in it for the last, I think it's been up about seven years. Uh -huh. So it's good traffic all the time. If providing a snag is impossible in your area, you can provide artificial cavities or houses by building your own or buying one at a home and garden supply store. Now here's a birdhouse that I built out of pressure treated lumber to preserve it for a longer time. You do not need a perch because on a nat in a natural situation on a snag or a dead tree, you usually have a hole and then there's bark or the rough wood is below that so that the birds can grab a hold of the wood with their toenails before they, they uh, go inside the holes. I use galvanized nails so they will last a long time out in the outdoor elements. Also easy access to cleaning it out. Just on the side here, a couple nails provide a hinge. Easy to clean it out. Has uh, ventilation on both sides here. And so uh, the hole is about an inch and a half diameter, which is appropriate size for a lot of different cavity nesting birds. I'm going to put my birdhouse up on this pole I have in my backyard. I already have the holes pre drilled. I'm going to put it on a pole instead of uh, a tree because I just don't like uh, putting nails in trees because it damages a tree somewhat. And it's going to be about uh, six feet high which would be appropriate height for a lot of different birds. I might get more use if I, I might get more use if I had it higher up in the tree, but then I wouldn't be able to uh, have access to it and clean it out. There. There's another option available here. The uh, entrance hole is somewhat bigger, maybe about two inches in diameter. Uh, 
It's all dressed up, has some moss in front with the, uh, the pillars. Uh, this is quite appealing to people, but I don't think it makes much difference to birds. As I said before, most natural uh, cavities are on dead trees where there is a large vertical surface for them to come up and fly and, and grab a hold of below the hole. Uh, this is not provided in this house, so it's assumed that the birds are gonna land here and walk across their front yard and then walk into the hole. Not very natural entrance situation for most cavity nesting birds. Uh, it's a very rugged uh, style here. Uh, again, you, difficult to get access to this type of house to clean it out periodically. Uh, and also attaching it to something would be very cumbersome. I guess you're supposed to hang it from a branch or some kind of structure uh, with this rope on the top. Purple martins are unique cavity nesting birds that have adapted to only nesting in birdhouses. Houses for wrens should be placed under an eave or tree limb, and all other houses should be firmly attached to a post or building. It's best to have birdhouses set out by March before the major nesting season begins. Florida's 17 species of bats have also lost many of the places they used to call home. Artificial structures have become a necessity. Now bats are a lot more difficult to attract than birds, but we can also provide cover for them. This is a bat house, and the, the way that bats nest is different than birds because they don't need a hole in front like the birds need a hole to gain access to a cavity, but they rather come in and out from the bottom and so if you want to construct a bat house or buy a bat house, you want to make sure that it has entrance from the bottom and rough surfaces are important so the bats can grab a hold of as they roost inside there. And you can see this one has a partition in the middle to kind of divide it up to allow accommodations for more bats by having these partitions in there. And so when they exit, they simply drop down and then fly away. I'm going to put this bat house up on a dead tree in my backyard. I've already driven a nail into the tree so that uh, all I have to do is climb up and attach this bat house to it. I'm going to put it on the east side so that it'll warm up early in the morning uh, after a relatively cool night so the babies won't uh, stay cool very long. And I'm going to put it up about 15 feet high to allow enough room for the bats to drop out before they start flying. Bat houses can also be placed on a pole or building. Keep in mind, it may take a while before bats decide to use a new house. University of Florida researchers had to wait three years for bats to set up residence in their huge bat house in Gainesville. It now houses over 20,000 bats. Each evening, they leave the roost to feed. These bats consume thousands of mosquitoes and other insects each night. Underground burrows provide nesting or refuge cover for many animals. Burrows are uniquely insulated against winter cold and summer heat and give amphibians a damp place to retreat. Burrows can be found at the base of trees or are dug by such animals as gopher tortoises or armadillos. Underground burrows are a very important type of cover for many wildlife species. At least four dozen different types of wildlife, including frogs, toads, snakes, lizards, small mammals, larger mammals such as armadillos and possums, utilize underground burrows. If you don't have an underground burrow that was naturally made on your property, you can provide one in kind of an artificial way by getting a plastic drain tile from a local lumber supply store. So to have an underground burrow, first of all, you need to dig a ditch. So you need a shovel to do that, and the ditch should be about eight feet long and then shaped in a, in a V shape so that the two entrances or the two ends of the drain tile that you're going to put in this trench will be up at these ends, and then they'll kind of go down into the ground about two and a half, three feet deep at the middle of the V. And so about eight feet long and about the width of a shovel would be sufficient. And so I've dug one here already. I'll just kind of finish it up. Make sure it's in a V shape. Okay, so that looks pretty good.
Then this is that plastic drain tile that has holes in it so that when it rains, the water will come in the entrances and it can percolate out through the soil so that the drain tile itself will not fill up with water. So we'll make sure the holes are placed down and see if it fits. It looks like it's appropriate length. The entrance will be here. We'll fill all this up with dirt so this will just kind of blend into the, uh, the surroundings. So in order to make sure that this stays in a V shape, the first couple shovelfuls, you're going to have to step on the middle of the, the drain tile, most likely, and hold it down until you have enough dirt in there that will hold it down. Now just uh, compacting the soil, make sure I have enough fill over top of the tile. That looks pretty good. So I put this drain tile in my yard, I put it in one of my bedding areas, as you can see I'm pulling the chips back over to finish it off, and later on I'm going to put different plants in this area. So I can put plants in this area and the ro roots will grow out laterally and around the drain tile, so that really won't interfere with any of my plantings. So we had the drain tile in the ground, covered it all up with chips, and we kept the entrance free from debris so the animals can find it, have easy access. You probably have leaves and different things coming in front of the entrance, getting blown in by the wind periodically, so you can just reach in there and kind of clear them out occasionally. So now all you need is a flashlight. Turn the flashlight on and look down in the hole there to see if you have anything living in there. Small tree frogs often seek cover from the intense heat of the sun. A unique type of cover can be easily provided, offering a cool and humid retreat. One type of cover you can provide for tree frogs are PVC pipes, or tree frog houses you might call them. And all it consists of is a PVC pipe. I like about the inch and a half diameter variety. You can have the, the thicker kind of PVC pipe or the thinner kind of PVC pipe. It really doesn't make any difference. You can put it out in its natural white color. You can paint it, kind of camouflage it if you want to. The camouflage will only kind of blend it into the, the surroundings of plants that you might have there. Uh, so all you have to do is just take the PVC pipe, three, four feet long, and just stick it in the ground in a partially shaded area, I think, is best because the tree frogs have the suction cup toes and they will climb up this relatively smooth surface and for some reason they find out that inside here it's relatively cool and relatively moist so it's ideal habitat ideal cover for them during the hot part of the day when the sun is out and so all you have to do is just stick them in the ground and the tree frogs will find them and use them for cover Another type of cover that's easy to provide is a rock pile. Dozens of lizards and snakes seek a place to warm up on cool days and cool down on hot summer days. They can also seek shelter in the cracks and crevices of the pile. The next time you think of putting pruned or fallen limbs in the trash, consider building a brush pile instead. Many animals, such as rabbits and ground nesting birds, would find a cozy home in that pile. With a few simple steps, you can make a long-lasting brush pile that offers cover to wildlife. Another type of cover that is used by many wildlife species is a brush pile. And I'm going to go through step by step on how you can create a brush pile. One of the most important things is to start off with a solid base, something that's very strong, something that will not decompose over time. If you start a brush pile by just simply throwing brush or twigs or branches on the ground, the small little branches are going to eventually decay, break off, and you're going to end up with your, your brush pile very close to the ground. And this will be bad because there will not be a lot of little crevices for wildlife to find cover, such as is already provided with these concrete blocks. You can see these holes right here. And all we have to do is kind of cover those holes up with some kind of 
vegetation, some kind of branches over top of those, and that'll be really good cover for a lot of wildlife species. So after you have a good solid base for the center of your brush pile, it's always best to start off with the thickest logs, the th thickest uh, twigs, branches that you have. Here I have an old Christmas tree, and I'm gonna put the, the thickest part of this, the trunk to the outside and then have the smaller branches resting on the base here, which in this case is the cinder blocks again. Here's another old Christmas tree, and I can put that off in the uh, other direction. And then we can get to the smaller branches. There, so now my brush pile is essentially finished in this particular stage anyhow, as some of these branches decay, uh, decompose, fall down, it kind of settles down to the ground. I might add on uh, different branches to cover up uh, little holes I might see later on. Uh, you can also beautify a structure such as this by planting uh, plants around the brush pile that might have flowers, attract butterflies, different wildlife species. You can plant vines, coral, honeysuckle, trumpet vine, passion flower that will interwine uh, throughout your brush pile and beautify it. Providing cover for wildlife is as simple as planting diverse vegetation, not cutting down snags, and offering a variety of housing and refuge options. Preserving native wildlife in our cities and towns will help us maintain the essential bond between people and nature and foster a sense of stewardship for the land. No matter where you live in Florida, attracting wildlife to your backyard will bring you closer to nature and benefit our wild friends. Landscaping for Florida's Wildlife is a three-part video series available from University of Florida's Institute of Food and Agricultural Sciences. The three videos, providing food, providing cover, and providing water can be purchased separately or as a set from the IFAS Extension Bookstore at 1-800-226-1764.